Thank you, Justine. Again, thanks a lot for taking that uh, conversation through uh, the key technical details of what equipment and what software really helpful. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. And um, you all can see the screen? Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, it's it's really three three to four more minutes, so don't don't panic. Uh, we're over time. Uh, so you again, I'm taking you back to the first study area where we were doing some. Uh, you remember the gummy bear, the virtual gummy bear exercise? We started today uh, after Justine's presentation. We tried to understand some of these parameters. We 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 looked at the these three parameters and also abundance. Same study. All I have done this time is, and, and now oh, you might also remember, these are the individuals that we captured. All that we've done is we have introduced, uh, oh, okay, one more point. In total, there were about 340 or so encounters of these different individuals on various cameras that were set up. Now, what I have done is I have introduced errors in terms of identifying individuals. So I have, so for example, uh, there was a camera trap here and it encountered the snow leopard S, but I forcefully say that, no, I don't know which is that it is S. I'm going to call it a new name. Let's say we call it S1 or MID1 or whatever right, Miss ID one or whatever. Let's say, I think that's a different snow leopard just because the patterns I feel or the, the way the picture was taken, I have misidentified this one animal. Similarly, there could be another scenario, I might misidentify two animals and three animals. So I've, I've, we've taken these three different scenarios of what will happen if we misidentify one out of the, uh, whatever number of captures you have, two out of all the captures or three out of all the captures. In other words, if you look carefully, we had snow leopard A, B, C, D all the way, and they were like F was missing and uh, M was missing. There were a lot of snow leopards missing. So in total, we have 17 snow leopards that we have counted. C is 17. When I add MID1, I just add a little bar here and that makes my C is equal to now 18. When I add Miss ID 2, I make the C is equal to 19. When I add a third extra individual in the population as a misidentified individual, I make the C, the total count as uh, 20. So these are the three scenarios. And what we did, we ran a simulation by randomly choosing any of these encounters. You see there are 300 or so encounters here. Any of these, let's say in the first scenario, we, we randomly chose one of these uh, encounters as a new individual. In another, and, and then we, we ran that exercise about, uh, for now, just 50 times. What we've done, uh, when we run this 50 times, these are the kind of results we get. So when I, add one misidentified individual. So instead of C17, now C, the count is 18. I end up with a bias of about 5%, right? And I ran this, uh, this scenario about 50 times. Yes, so it's somewhere between 7% or to somewhere around 0.1% uh, or, or let's say 1% to 7% or something. Now that's where it's averaging out. Similarly, when we add two misidentified individuals, we, our bias actually jumps to somewhere between uh, roughly, um, I think it goes around 12 or 13%. When I add three misidentified individuals out of 17, we end up with about 17 or uh, 18 of, of a bias. Now, this is the kind of variation that we end up adding to our data a bias that we add up to our data, which in other words can be looked at as, uh, you remember we were, we were uh, throwing, sh shooting arrows or, 
or throwing uh, darts on the dartboard. Now, here what we have ended up is we, we, we believe the target is somewhere entirely different and we are uh, estimating the value there. So what we end up doing by misidentifying individuals is introduce a bias in the data. There are means to address it, but uh, uh, there's still no very elegant means to include this within the spatial capture recapture analysis. And the best way it is dealt with right now is you report that your errors could be broader than what you have ended up with uh, in case you have misidentified. But to be very honest, and people often feel uh, a little uncomfortable in, 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 in throwing away data, if there is any image that you have the slightest of doubt or you have less than three patterns in its body that you can match with another snow leopards or not or find definitely to be different between the two, two images, just discard that picture for the time being. All that it will do is it will increase your error. It will reduce your precision, but it may not reduce your accuracy. We are okay to live with less precise results, but less accuracy can be challenging. A bias can be difficult and it can, it can create problems, whereas less accuracy, uh, less precision is all right. You still will be somewhere in the larger uh, scheme of things. So, so ultimately, if you discard one or two images or five images or seven, eight images, all you're doing is out of those 100, 120 encounters, you've taken taking away a few and what you're left with will at the most, in the worst case scenario, reduce your precision a little bit, but they will not bias your results. So it's very important to keep that in mind uh, while brutally, almost ruthlessly discarding any images that are not identifiable enough. And if you end up with 50, 60% images as Justine was mentioning, then you need to change something. You need to change the equipment you're using. You need to change the way you are setting up camera traps. You need to change uh, uh, some somewhere. You need to change something in the design or equipment part. But otherwise, 10%, 5 10% images, if you are discarding, we can live with it. Remember, ultimately, there were 26 snow leopards in this population. Out of 26, we only counted uh, 17. And the maximum likelihood estimator was able to, to tell us how many snow leopards are there. Uh, it was still able to count 26 animals for us, right? So even though we counted 17, it was able to estimate that you did not see the remaining nine and it came up with a number. Now, all we are seeing is maybe one less image uh, in that whole data and that's it. So it will, in the worst case scenario, just increase your variance to small extent. But if you, if you include that image in your analysis, then you end up with a situation which could be a bias of with just three images uh, misidentified as three different individuals, you're dealing with a 20% increase in your, uh, in your abundance. And that's something that we have to be very careful and uh, wary of. So that's all from my side. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy if we have some discussions around this or if you'd like to uh, have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Between Justin and I will be able to take care of the answers. Yeah. I mean, I, just to add to what you said, Christo, um, and I mentioned it last time, is you often see people argue that we shouldn't discard because maybe we're discarding certain snow leopard individuals and then we're underestimating uh, the number of animals that there are. And this is especially in the IUCN debate, right, um, that's often used. Um, so, but I think what you highlighted is right. It's not necessarily that we're dis disregarding one individual or two individual. It's a random set of encounters of our population. Um, so it doesn't necessarily underrepresent our population. So do not be afraid to disregard your photos. Yeah. Thank so you. Just, very, very, very important to re-emphasize and keep this point in mind to, to not worry that your estimates will go down. They may not. Your design will take care of it. The spatial capture recapture is essentially meant to take care of that. All that you have to think through in that scenario is that may, when, when you have a picture that you cannot identify a snow leopard with, 
think about it that your camera trap didn't even take a picture. So think of it like that, that for some reason, the camera trap did not take a picture even when the snow leopard walked in front of it. And it is, it is going to happen on many occasions if a snow leopard just ran through in front of the camera. It may not trigger. If it just walks behind the camera, it wouldn't trigger. So it's a, it's a very likely and a very plausible scenario, which is why you shouldn't worry too much about discarding images if you have any doubts about any of those images. Now, thanks, Justine, for uh, re-emphasizing. Yeah. Any questions regarding this? We'll be more than happy to answer. If you have any other concerns or challenges about what we've covered so far, we've kind of covered a lot of ground today. So um, sorry if we went too fast or too slow. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, and also we have our last session next week. Um, so if there's anything you would like us to cover or recover for next week, please let us know. We're going to be focusing more on analysis and, and what it means in terms of the results and how to interpret that. Um, but please let us know. I see some, uh, some, uh, yeah. some questions coming in, especially about prey. Yeah, in terms of camera trap data, I didn't mention uh, that it's great that a lot of our cameras also get other species. Um, uh, in detected, um, but that is often the case, which is great because you can use that data in terms of understanding what other uh, the what other diversity is in your landscape. Um, but in terms of using SCR for individuals, remember SCR you have to you have to know your individuals. You have to be able to distinguish individuals, and that's very hard with uh, species like prey where there are several thousands <laughs> in your landscape and uh, and it's very hard to to compare and also they're very they they are more dependent one another assumption we remember was that our individuals were independent of each other and we didn't consider cubs with moms as separate individuals right but often prey uh, populations are clumped um so they move together um so that's why we have uh, other uh other methods such as the double observer method that actually use mark recapture theory behind it but related at the group level so you have a group how often do you recapture that group and that's covered in module two of uh of this uh this training sln training so if Tikar, if you want to join that and learn about double observer data let us know i mean and other ways to deal with the prey data kustub often people have used occupancy to just look at space use of different species, right? There are other ways to use this data. Exactly. In fact, as we speak, Justine and Puji are, try, uh, are uh, helping uh, put this uh, fantastic data together to, to, to use a space use, uh, to, or to create a space use surface with the camera trapping encounters of prey. And then we can potentially use that surface as a, uh, as a factor affecting snow leopard density. So there, there, there are means in which it, uh, it is possibly going to work out. Uh, but yes, uh, abundance, no. But by the way, just to mention uh, on that note, there is one recent publication which uses distance sampling from camera traps. Uh, there are some strong assumptions. So I, we wouldn't recommend just go ahead and start using it. Uh, there are some very strong assumptions behind that, but it does make an interesting uh, foray into how some of these unidentifiable species can can be estimated or their populations can be estimated with a slightly different design than what we use for, for spatial capture recapture. So once, if you're able to address that design issue, then there, there could be means in which you use distance sampling with camera traps to estimate prey population. But again, it's not really been tested in the snow leopard landscape. So we wouldn't be in a position to suggest or uh, suggest either way that it's working or it's not working. So we have a question so, from Helena. I was wondering if Puji wanted to answer that. Puji, if you're here, do you want to answer Helena's question on what camera trap model you recommend? Let's see if she's around. Oh, you 
Fuji, your sound is not very good. I, you must have, I think maybe the, the signal is not so good. So we can't hear you. Um, but you can work in the chat. Dude, the chat was working. But I think it's the recording oh. is the best, I think. Oh, now we hear you. Go for it. Uh. Yeah, so Puji is saying, uh, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, maybe she doesn't hear us now. Yeah, probably. So she yes. can write it in the chat, but yes, she's, we've been using the Reconix models in Mongolia. So, yeah, so Helena, honestly, the cheapest model of Reconix is better than many of the more expensive models in, uh, in, in, uh, in other brands. At least that's what we've found so far. I think the cheapest one we call, it's called Hyperfire uh, something, right? 500 or something like that. So we, we're using those extensively. Uh, earlier we used to use uh, RM40, uh, RM45 and RC40, I think. There was one more which was colored in the day. Uh, these cameras do fairly well in the... Uh, Their cameras is sort of. often, uh, I know, Chris, if you've tested it, but a lot of teams recommend Bushnells because it's more, they're more affordable, but they have quite a fast trigger speed. Um, yeah. So I think people, that's another option. And in China, they use LTL Archon cameras. Um, but the problem with these photos is nighttime pictures are, are not the tree. It's not so, uh, the sensitivity is not so strong. So you get a lot and you get a lot of blurry images, but they set it to videos to deal with that. And that kind of addresses some of the issues um, with that. But yeah, there's a wide range to choose from. The problem with Reconyx is the price. But if in the, our case, we, we thinking long-term, it's sometimes more expensive to buy new ones every year, every two years, um, if, if, uh, because they, they others go kaput or something. So, yeah. And is that, you like the infrared on that, on the Reconyx? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah I think uh, generally it's, uh, it works pretty well. Those, all the images I showed were Reconyx infrared, even the nighttime pictures. I agree, Fuji. Yes, Reconyx is expensive, but in the long run, it's very cheap because it just doesn't go bad. I have to tell you this funny incident. So two years ago, uh, in fact, five years ago, we set up a camera trap in one of the mountains in Kyrgyzstan in Sarichat Ertash Reserve. And in the after the summer in spring, they, no, not after the summer, after the winters during spring, there was a, there was a uh, landslide and the, and it went through the camera and we lost that camera. Two years late, uh, or later, uh, our team was surveying, walking on horseback uh, along the river. And one of the persons see, sees something in the, in the river and they, they go inside, they pull it out. It was a Reconyx camera trap. It turned out that it was the same Reconyx camera trap that had that we had lost in the landslide. They opened it. It was all uh, rusted inside. The battery was rusty and the uh, contacts were rusty. They just switched it off, switched it on, and it was still working. So <laughs> two years in water through a landslide, and this camera comes out working. And yeah, it's just unreal at times, but. Sometimes you, you have good luck, sometimes you have good units. But yeah, so far we've been, we've been fairly lucky. Great, so I think Reki, she's actually left, but she's because she's probably pulling her hair out because we've gone over time and we're not showing any yeah. signs of ending. Um, but another thing that we didn't mention that we'll send out is there's an app to make recommendations on your study area design that was uh, developed by the help desk team at PAUSE. Um, so we'll send out uh, this cheat sheet on how to use this app and you can trial it with real data as well as I think there's some simulation data that's available to trial it out. Um, so 
uh, please do so. We'll send it this week, right, Kustu? Yep. Yeah. Oh, Reki's come back to, to <laughs> And she's that. in the waiting area. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, thank you all, I guess. And thank please you. send your questions this week. We'll send out an email. Uh, thank you. It's really nice to see you guys every week and showing up. And I hope it's useful. We hope that's the ideal. So we'll stay on the call, but if everyone else want to say goodbye, that would be super. I'll stop recording. <laughs>